Hello, everybody out there on the internet. This is David Rovix with another episode of Discussions, which is my uh, periodic uh, broadcast, which usually goes out on uh, Wednesdays and some Fridays at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern on various platforms, including the Facebook page of KBU Community Radio and Facebook page of Popular Resistance, as well as my own Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Twitch, and um what am I forgetting? Somewhere else. And um, it's all archived at youtube.com slash drovix. And it goes out in podcast form if you look for This Week with David Rovix, wherever you get your podcasts. And uh, and th today I'm really excited to be spending the hour with public historian Susan Soderberg, who has, has been for the past 10 years working on uh, researching and working on a book about Josiah Henson, who we're going to talk about uh, for the hour, as well as um, her work as a public historian. Um, and, um, and with no further ado, we'll talk a lot more about that with her right here. Susan, <laughs> great to have you Hello. with me. And uh, this book that you're working on looks absolutely fascinating. And the, to be a public historian, and well, I want to talk about what that means, but just to put that into context, I mean, right now in the context of the movement that's been going on over the past few years and uh, how controversial, uh, basically, public history, you know, and history generally, uh, and, um, you know, the history that is presented to us all around us in the form of statues and all, and this has become a big, big talking point, controversial and everything else but and then for the past 10 years you've been working on this book about another fascinating and controversial uh, historical uh, figure and and I just want to um, kind of start out with uh, just getting a little bit of an idea of, of who, who the author of this book is before we get into who Josiah um, was and and uh, and you actually you actually grew up in in a town that I uh, it, for those who haven't been there, it uh, Williamsburg, Virginia. It actually looks it, it's you know it's a historically maintained town, and it and it looks a lot like it did uh, I guess like two hundred years ago with wooden sidewalks and such. It still has wooden sidewalks in Williamsburg. Yeah, how, how much did how much did growing up in the historic town influence your desire your 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 uh, desire yes. to become a historian? It can't help but influence it. You know, um, I was at first adamant about when I went to college not going into history because I was inundated with history, especially colonial history. And so I wanted to branch out into something else. And I ended up, I also didn't want to follow in the footsteps of my older sister, which I'd done all the way through high school. So um, she had gone into history. She um, went history? actually, yeah, she went into Chinese history. So and I ended up uh, getting a degree from the College of William and Mary um, in art history. And um, I worked for a while at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C. And um, so after my children were in, all in school and I had some time to myself and realized I had a whole nother life ahead of me, I decided to go into history. and. Uh, American studies, I guess my background did have some influence on me. But when I looked at all my different options, I realized they all had history behind them and how important history is. And I think that these days we realize how important it is uh, who controls the story. Mm -hmm. It's become very politicized. Uh, so it's important for everyone to know history and to know their own history and to know the history of their uh, country and their place because it is so um, often controlled. And then the, the, the telling of history through in the form of public history is, is I mean, well, public history is uh, uh, what I do is translate all of the uh, language of the PhDs, mm -hmm. who mainly talk and write to each other. I translate that into something that the public can understand and that appeals to the public. 
but still having a basis in history. Anyone who knows me can tell you that I'm very strict about citations and about having a, a backing for whatever you say. The facts are important. I wonder how common, I mean, in the, in the work of public history, it seems like, you know, some uh, through the ages anyway, uh, it seems like the efforts being made in terms of uh, what kinds of, uh, what, what pieces of history get remembered in the form of statues and other public, uh, uh, public facing uh, things like, like that sort of, uh, I mean, it, it's, you know, or, or simplified tellings of like textbooks, I don't know. You know, it, it, uh, the simplification of something often becomes. Uh, you can see where the narrative is going, where where the the viewpoint of the of the narrative is coming from, or the or the, pure, the person telling the story is is coming from. Right? It's often kind of uh, trying to lead us in a certain direction. That's correct, and you'd be surprised at how easy it is to control the public memory and direct mm -hmm. it in certain directions. David Borstein. Uh, wrote a book about this. And another example is um, a book called uh, Pickett's Charge. And the author of this book looked at all of the different accounts from both sides of Pickett's Charge at the Battle of Gettysburg and the Civil War, and how different all the memories were, mm. how very widely different these memories were of the people who had participated in this one event together. So, so your own memory and the collective public memory is very subject, very much subject to, to influence. Mm -hmm. And then, I mean, a story can be told about a country or a place or a person and, and people can become really emotionally invested in this story that is actually just completely made up from the first place, right? I mean, that, that, oh, yes. that, that happened a lot. That, that has happened quite a lot. Uh, I actually had to, as a public historian, um, I, to give you an example, um, I was training docents for a cabin that was lived in by enslaved people, a slave cabin. And we had to be very careful about our interpretation for different audiences. And then one time an audience, a visitor came and asked, well, what about the quilts used in the Underground Railroad? Because I had also involved with this cabin, I had also trained guides for an Underground Railroad trail. And that was the first Underground Railroad experience trail in Maryland and maybe in many places the way that we did it. But going back to the question about the quilts, I looked into this and uh, this book that was written by uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Dobard and uh, a woman whose last name was Jack, uh, Jacqueline Tobin, it, it was all based on myth, the whole thing. There was no factual evidence that quilts were ever used on the Underground Railroad for for signaling. And wow. so I had to do a lot of research to back up my counter to this. And um, it, a, a lot of, I mean, all of the historians back me up. The historians were, um, of course, they like to base things on facts as well. And there was no factual evidence whatsoever for this. Right. Was yes. was there pushback but, from that? As well, far as, like, yeah, saying, because oh, but you don't have evidence, but it really happened, and right, so. it never happened. But uh, when I would tell people about this, um, some of the people would say, "Well, uh, I don't care if it's not true; it's a good story," and they would carry it on, even though this was part of their history. No. And the actual Underground Railroad is so much more interesting than saying, well, they signal each other with quilts and messages mm -hmm. and quilts and things like that. But they, uh, people thought, well, quilts are pretty. The Underground Railroad is not pretty. It's gritty. It's dangerous. And it was very, very difficult for the people who escaped or did not manage to escape were caught. So the yeah, quilt, it's not like a the pretty story. Book. 
the, the, the yeah. children's book version kind of is what ends up <laughs> yeah. getting told, right? Right, exactly. Yes. I mean, I heard on the news yesterday, and I'm, I'm not saying it, it was a, a, a bad call or anything, but I, I heard the newscaster said um, the crime was too gruesome for us to describe here. And and I mean, that the phrase really stuck with me. I mean, that, well, that's quite a thing to say about something that you're covering on the news. And I understand uh, not describing the gruesomeness of the crime perfectly well, but I mean, just how, just the phrase, just th I thought, well, how, yeah. how much history well, gets sanitized because how yeah. horrible the reality was. So, well, that that's, is from the Greek tragedies, you know, they never portrayed the killings and the maimings on stage. They had somebody run in and tell somebody else about it. Mm. Mm. Yeah, right. The, so how did you, I mean, Josiah Henson was the, uh, the, the, the basis for the mythology that gave rise to the book, uh, the bestseller uh, at the time, Uncle Tom's Cabin, which then uh, over generations afterwards took on so many different meanings for so many different people and, and you know, very positive, very negative, all kinds of things in between. And then, I mean, it's such an iconic uh, figure that then gets so tr tremendously misunderstood and differently understood. And then, and then to find that the guy himself, who actually was not Uncle Tom, but was a real person, Josiah Henson, actually wrote several autobiographies uh, himself. And then and then, but then you're actually doing research to find out like what really happened rather than rather than going on the fiction or of, the, of yes. the Uncle Tom's Cabin or on the what turns out to be, to some extent, the fiction of his several autobiographies, which uh, that's true. quite impressive yeah. to write three autobiographies yeah. about anyone. I mean, it, it, yeah. regardless of how in interesting one's life has been, that's quite something to write three <laughs> autobiographies about yourself. But uh, Actually, but there are a couple of seven, David. Seven. Oh, my goodness. But he only wrote, act, he never wrote. He only dictated one and a half <laughs> of all of those. They're all written by other people, but mm. let me start at the beginning. Yeah, please. Uh, the idea that was pa is, is still uh, being passed around is that he was the model for Uncle Tom and Uncle Tom's cabin, and that he met with uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe before she wrote the book, and she he told her his story, and she based uh, her book her fictional book uncle tom on him uncle tom by the way since most americans have not read it a lot of people in other countries have read it because it's used to teach english mm. and so but a lot of americans have not read it and in if you read uncle tom from cover to cover you will find out that he is not what you think of as the uncle tom character Mm -hmm. He is a Christ-like character, and he dies in the end by being beaten to death because he won't tell where these two girls are hiding. Mm -hmm. Anyway, back to Josiah Henson. He actually never met uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe until after uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin had been written. Mm -hmm. He did, um, and... I could go into the details of how I figured that out, but <laughs> so you, you figured that out, even though I mean, this is this, that's pretty major because this is for this over a century. It's been the the accepted mythology was that Uncle Tom's Cabin was written based on uh, the life of Josiah Henson, but you discovered <laughs> they did he, he didn't meet the author uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe until after she wrote the book. Right, not face to face, but here's what happened. Oh, okay. She she first. Uh, published the book in serial form in uh, the New Era newspaper. And she was uh, getting to the end of the story, and she was trying to find some kind of ending for the story which would emphasize Uncle Tom as being a very religious person and um, a sacrificing character so that he would, she wanted, she knew how she he would die, but he had to give her, give him motivation mm -hmm. for sacrificing himself. 
so she, sort of yeah, story. she was uh, visiting her sister in Boston and she went to the um, abolitionist library and she was looking through all, a lot of the slave narratives uh, these are published by the abolitionists that um, uh, to raise money for the abolitionist movement, and uh, and these were dictated and sometimes written, self-written, uh, on occasion. But mainly, they were dictated, and they were stories that would raise people's uh, feelings about slavery. And so she went to this library and she found this book that Josiah Hansen had written. He had, um, uh, I'll tell you why he wrote that um, in a few minutes, but he had dictated this book. He could uh, read a little bit, uh, but not really write. And uh, he had dictated this to uh, the uh, person that he knew in um, Boston who had written it down and actually paid for the publishing himself. And the, there were very few copies, about 500 copies uh, of this original 1849 autobiography of Josiah Henson that uh, were published. So she read this and there is an incident that he talks about in his life where he is, uh, even after he's purchased his freedom and uh, he's gone to, to uh, Kentucky to his owner's brother's plantation in Kentucky with his wife and children. And even though he has his manumission papers, they are going to sell him because he's a troublemaker. Mm. <laughs> he's, a, he's a preacher. He's uh, riling up uh, the... Um, the people to by making them Christian, the, the enslaved people. But they just think that he's a troublemaker. So they send him with the young man, um, the son of the plantation owner, down to New Orleans. And he knows he's going to be sold. He's on this flat boat with uh, the owner's son, who's about 18, 19 years old, and uh, these three other white men. And they uh, have given him a lot of leeway because he's been a trusted slave for a long time. And he learned how to steer the flatboat and how to manage it. So they let him take uh, care the, of navigating the flatboat down the Mississippi River at night, which was very precarious. But they were sleeping in the cabin there in the flatboat, and he had this idea that he could take this ax and he stood over these three sleeping men with the ax and thought, if I kill them, I can step off of this boat to free land and be a free person. But, but then he stopped himself and he said, but I am a Christian man and I don't want to spend the rest of my life as a murderer. And so his talking to himself he talked himself out of murder. And when she read this, she said, this is what I need. This is a very religious man. So she took um, some other incidents of his life from his autobiography that had to do with his uh, belief in God and Christianity. And uh, he, she actually took the same incident with the Acts um, in her book, uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin. So... This was at the end, at the end of the book. And this is uh, after then the book was published in a book form and became such a bestseller. And all of these people who were purchasing were saying that, oh, slavery couldn't be this bad. You're exaggerating. Mm -hmm. So she published uh, The Key to Uncle Tom's Cabin, which has enormous book actually and it had all of her factual information mm -hmm. all of the um, slave narratives and all of the facts that she had gathered about slavery in the south in the key to uncle tom's cabin and in the key she told about her being influenced by josiah henson she said uh, 
talked about how religious he was. But he was, she also said that he was not the only person to form the character of Uncle Tom. More, uh, yeah. Yeah. And, and, yeah. And so so they, that's, that's how, you know, he got hyped up uh, mm -hmm. by publishers who wanted to make money from him being, and the book, uh, his third book was titled the real Uncle Tom. <laughs> yeah, you could see that. Yeah, coming, right with the, the publishers. So like, my yeah. book, my book that I'm writing is called The Real Josiah Henson. Oh, great, great. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> one of those wonderful historian inside jokes that the people who get it will be like, "Oh, that's hilarious," and everybody. Oh else, well. <laughs> well, that's how jokes are. <laughs> yeah, and Josiah Henson after uh, so so he he he. Per, he purchased his freedom. It was a situation, and but then they they, they were going to sell him literally down the river again. Well, yeah, it, it's. Um, would you mind if I started the beginning because oh, it makes more place. sense? We got plenty of time. Yeah. Yes, great. great so, idea. Okay. <laughs> making sense is always helpful. <laughs> yeah, Josiah Henson was born enslaved in Southern Maryland, and when he was about when he was nine years old. They say six, but he had lied about his age through his whole life. We um, have evidence that he was actually born in uh, 18, in 1796, not in 1789, as he said. So he was younger than he said he was. That's sort of par for the course because no, it was very, very unusual for an enslaved person to know when they were born. Mm. This would have been, and, and sometimes these slave narratives open up with, I was born on this year at this place with this master. And it, it's a formula that they use in the slave narratives. So you have to come up with a year. And somehow he came up with this year. I don't know if he really was aware that he was making himself younger, but uh it's, Knowing his character now as well as I do, I think you did. Mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway, I made himself older, I'm sorry, than mm -hmm. he actually was because it served his purpose at the time. So he was sold uh, to um, a farmer in Rockville, Maryland, um, just outside of Rockville. And this uh, fellow, Isaac Wiley, uh, was, uh, he became, after... When he was about 18 years old, Josiah Henson got religion. He yeah. heard a minister uh, giving one of these uh, uh, sermons at a mill and uh, one of these itinerant ministers. And he was really struck by the fact that what he said, um, quoting from the Bible, that Jesus died for everyone, not just the wealthy, he died for the poor and the servants as well. So he just became converted at that point and uh, went to religious services on an active basis. But he was listening to the white ministers and they were saying things like um, quoting parts of the Bible that would agree with the slave masters. Mm. You know, that slaves, uh, servants should obey their masters and, and should be loyal to them. And, and he believed this. He believed that because he was born enslaved, God had made him a slave. So then it was his duty to be the best slave he could. Mm. So he worked very hard for his master. He became his trusted servant, the master Isaac Riley would take him with him to the taverns to protect him. He put him in charge of overseeing work on the plantation. And one of these tavern bouts, when everybody got drunk, they got in a brawl and uh, Josiah Henson, in extracting his master from this brawl, accidentally hit, uh, elbowed another person a white man. Later on, a few weeks later, this white man wanted to get it in for both for him and for uh, he was an enemy of the master, Isaac Riley. So he wanted to put destroy one of part of his property, mm -hmm. his enslaved person. So he and some of his slaves lay in wait for 
to Cy Henson and they beat him severely hmm. at a fence post and broke his shoulder blades and his arms. Hmm. And he was not uh, given good medical attention after that. So uh, he mended very poorly. He could never raise his arms up above his shoulders ever after that time. People who knew him later in life would remark on that fact that his arms were crippled and um, he had trouble feeding himself. And he put on a hat by putting the hat on the table and then scooting himself underneath it. <laughs> and so he was maimed for life. He, from that time on, he remained loyal to his master, but he became his market man. He would take the produce to market. And so he, in Georgetown, he knew then he, the market was his school. He watched people. He learned from people. He learned how to talk like a gentleman. He knew how to sell. He became a really good salesman. And, you know, with salesmen, you have to sell yourself as well as the product you're selling. Mm. He learned how to dress. He learned about, uh, compact uh, contracts that people had uh, made with each other and what happened when they broke the contract he just it was his school the market was and he was there about three years then his master when it was in financial difficulty he was married Josiah Hansen and the master were both married by this time and had a couple of children so Isaac Riley asked Josiah Henson to take his slaves to his brother's plantation in Kentucky. This was a long distance and took them two months. He finally agreed to do it. Uh, they were given a horse and a wagon and a lot of provisions. They went up to um, the Ohio River and then got a boat and went down the Ohio River. But the trek from Rockville to the Ohio River was very difficult. And I believe that uh, his wife, Charlotte, lost a baby along the way because there's a gap in there between her babies. Mm. And there's some other indication that that could have happened. So now they're in the plantation at, uh, in Kentucky, and he is, again, given a lot of authority. He's uh, allowed to go to all the different farms that uh, this uh, new master owns and ride a horse around and um, he is overseeing all of these plantations and reporting back to the master. So the other thing that he learned in the market, he was very good at counting. He knew his numbers very well, but he could not read or write. And the sales, and, uh, the sales skills and the, uh, I wonder if that, that also contributed to, you know, being able to sell yourself and sell uh, things is very related to um, being, to, to the, uh, the re religious professions. I, I mean, I think. Exactly what really I was trying to get it? into yeah. next, David, because mm -hmm. that's, uh, yeah, that he found that he had a, a knack for oration. He, he was a good preacher and he was very well accepted for this. And so uh, one fall, one of the preachers that he knew said, come on over across the river to Cincinnati if you can get a pass and, uh, and I'll uh, get you to preach in these different parishes where they will give, donate money to you. So he did that. He got a pass from his master uh, that was a really extraordinary free pass uh, that gave him the uh, because he said he wanted to go back to Maryland to visit his mother. And so, because they'd left them, his mother behind uh, in Maryland. So he got this pass that allowed him a lot of freedom. He earned a lot of money preaching in o Ohio, in Cleveland, and then, I mean, in Cincinnati, and then in uh, different parts of Ohio. Got himself a good suit of clothes and a good horse and rode it back to Maryland. And his master's wife's brother had become very friendly with him back at the plantation when he was, the brother uh, was very, was growing up and had become, they'd become very close. So by this time, this brother, Francis Middleton, 
had become a lawyer. So he goes, he gets his pass, and he goes to Washington and consults with his friend, Francis Middleton. And between the two of them, they actually get to purchase his freedom with the money that he has uh, earned in the sale. He said to sell his horse. <laughs> and uh, he got his freedom papers. And so then he went back to Kentucky because he had his wife and children there in Kentucky. He had four children by that time. And that's when the incident happens where they try to sell him down uh, to New Orleans. And that's, so, and that's also the, the, the phrase uh, selling someone down the river. Or, or oh, originated yeah. From, that, from and he had Mississippi seen the, the people that he had brought with him from Isaac Riley's plantation. He brought uh, about a dozen other people besides his wife and children with him to Kentucky. Um, and his master had pledged to him, these people will not be sold. But then they were sold. Mm. And so that um, that really opened his eyes to the dishonesty of his master. Mm -hmm. And so then when they tried to sell him down south, down the river, he realized that whatever contract he thought he might have with his master was broken by the master. He no longer had any loyalty, any uh, obligation to that master. And that's when he decided to escape and take his wife and children. It took him a while to convince his wife to go. <laughs> but uh, they escaped to Canada. And uh, in Canada, he continued preaching. And he, um, he helped to form uh, with um, uh, Henry Wilson, um, Hiram, Hiram Wilson. Mm. He helped to form a school, an industrial school, and Dawn in what's now on Ontario, Canada, it was now then it was uh, um, Upper Canada. And they formed, they built this school. They, uh, Hiram Wilson was able to get money from the abolitionist societies for this school. And he was really, uh, Wilson was the one who planned the school and got it built. Uh, and, and Josiah has listed. How much of the, um, this, a very large uh, amount of the African uh, descended population in Canada are in Canada for ex very much the same kinds of reasons as Josiah Henson. Is that right? Oh, yes. Um, there were a few that were native Canadians that had come in the revolutionary war. Um, had been given land there by the British uh, by fighting for the, on the British side in the uh, Revolutionary War. And there were some early immigrants who lived in Canada, but um, there were about 20,000 uh, people at the time. And as the figures go, it's hard to tell exactly, but about that many in uh, Ontario, what's now Ontario. Um, so and they were uneducated. Uh, they had no skills. So this industrial school is called the British uh, American Industrial School, was to teach them reading and writing and arithmetic, and also to teach them a trade so that they'd be able to make their way in life. And it was based on a school in Oneida, New York, that Hiram Wilson had actually attended, where they had acreage with the school, and they would grow their own crops, and they had a um, would, uh, for instance, they had a rope factory. They would grow hemp for the rope and make rope to sell, and of How course the grains. The, the the abolitionist movement. I mean, I think that's. I I don't know how many people who know about the abolitionist movement are aware of, of these kinds of activities. Like, I mean, how, how widespread was that kind of thing, like starting up schools and doing things? I, I mean, you think of the abolitionists, I, I guess the first thing that might come to mind is these were people who are, who were petitioning the various governments and at various levels to oppose the institution of slavery. But there was actually so much more to the movement than just uh, fighting against the institution of slavery, like actually running schools and all sorts of other things like that. Yes. And like any big movement it was very fragmented and uh, actually kind of broke apart uh, when 
they they were devaluing the women's um, contributions. They weren't giving women leadership positions. And so, of course, the women went out and formed their own abolitionist society mm. <laughs> where they would have control. But the other thing is forming the schools was unusual. The abolitionist societies were uh, interested in freeing the slaves. And they were also fragmented in that regard. That is that some of them believed in freeing individual slaves through the Underground Railroad and by purchasing them, uh, raising money to purchase them. Others were uh, more inf- interested in uh, the whole movement of, of destroying the, the slavery itself, the institution that get rid of the, the institution of, the- of slavery. And then within that uh, a- aspect of the movement, there were, there were great, massive dis- divisions, right, between the, the, the Yes, wing that's and the true. Wing. But it, it, it turned out that, that the ones that wanted to start the schools um, kind of withdrew. And most of the abolitionists were in, more interested in freeing the slaves than in taking care of them after they were freed. That right. was the bottom line. They they really were not interested in what happened to them after they were freed. So you're on your own, then um, go support yourself, you know. Was that and, based in some kind of weird ideological pick yourself up by your bootstraps kind of thing? Yeah, it, yeah? I, I think it was that was kind of a Victorian attitude, you know. Mm-hmm. But that's why the school eventually failed uh, because of that. Um, Attitude support from the abolitionist movement. Yeah, but he was uh, Josiah Henson was trying to save the school from failing, and he had an idea of building a sawmill because uh, the property they owned was heavily forested with great walnut wood, so uh, walnut trees, and so he thought uh, that these could be sawed in a sawmill. And this idea he took to Boston and met some very wealthy, influential people in Boston who decided to help him out. They thought it was a good idea. And uh, they were not real abolitionists. They were uh, prominent men in Boston society that he met. They were Unitarians. And um, so they all were of the same congregation. That's how he met him through the ministers and um, and you're saying so that they, they weren't abolitionists, but they were from a church. They were abolition. Against. Yeah, they were against slavery. Yeah. But they yeah. weren't part of an abolitionist society. Mm. Um, to, as I say, there was a lot of politics going on in these societies at the time. So Sounds they supported like him. Today. The sawmill was built. They helped him to sell the walnut wood, uh, sawed walnut wood in Boston. Um, first First load went to a piano um, construction company, but uh, the the bottom dropped out of the market. Suddenly, everybody was selling wood from Canada, and so there wasn't uh, he wasn't making any money on this. One of the things he did at that point was one of these Unitarians. He got to uh, write his autobiography. He thought he could raise some money for the institute that way, for the school. And the, when the bottom dropped out of the lumber uh, market, then he, his friend said, well, I bet you could sell it in England. And there's this big international exhibit exhibition that's coming up, the big world exhibition in London. And so he got uh, took some of his walnut wood over there to the exhibition. And uh, that's how he got into the British society. He had all these letters of introduction from these famous people. One of them was Stanton, who later became uh, Secretary of State, who he had a letter of introduction from. Great. So he, he became a, but I mean, his his books sold well in in England, and he also was well. Actively um, he was called back from England. He, uh, this this was his first trip. To England, he was come, called back to Canada, and then he went back to England. But he, they did publish um, a part of his autobiography there in a new edition, and they changed a few, a few things in it. 
So it was because they changed a few things. It was a new autobiography. But here comes the big one. Mm. Then he become he goes back to Canada after being in England and um, where he was very well received and went around giving all these speeches to people and raising money for all the different causes there in England, but not a whole lot for the British Industrial School. <laughs> anyway, he goes back to Canada and uh, he finds out after a couple of years that he's known as the real Uncle Tom. That this mm -hmm. has gotten out. That uh, Harry Beecher Stowe uh, wrote this book and said in the key that he was one of the main influences on the character. So he says, I've got to meet this woman. So that's when in 1858, he's in Boston. And so he, he goes over to Andover and, um, and meets Harriet Beecher Stowe there. And she gives him a letter of introduction to her publisher, Jewett. John Jewett uh, is in Boston, so uh, Josiah Henson takes this letter of introduction from Harriet Beecher Stowe to John Jewett and with uh, the manuscripts that he had uh, from his original autobiography. He had had various uh, people, um, two or three different people writing up these manuscripts. One of them had been in England where they had published um as I said, a little bit more of his autobiography. So uh, Jewett took all of these different versions and put them all together. And um, he paid him a flat fee for this second autobiography, uh, which he had tried to do to Harriet Beecher Stowe. He tried to give her a flat fee for her book. Uh -huh. Yeah, but her sister, who was a one of her sisters was a very good at finances. And she said, no, 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 take a percentage. Do not take a flat fee, take a percentage, which so she did, which made there. her rich. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so, but um, he, uh, had, Josiah Hansen used that money to buy his brother's freedom mm. in 1858, mm. who was still enslaved in uh, Rockville. Mm. So that was Canada. Yeah, he came up to Canada. Right. And so they lived there for a while. And then he decided he wanted to go back to England. So he got some more letters of introduction. He went into debt is what happened. Uh, he was in a lawsuit and went into debt. He needed to raise money for himself. So he went back to England, and this is when he really got feted by uh, the lords and ladies and introduced to the Queen of England and gave, go, went around giving speaking tours. These tours were now sponsored not by the, um, by the philanthropists who were raising money for the cause. This was after the slaves were freed in America. So um, they were uh, book tours, really. He saw he gave his right of his book to a man by the name of John Loeb. John Loeb was a publisher of religious tracts, and he saw a gold mine, a goose that laid the golden egg when he found Josiah Henson. Mm -hmm. So he sponsored these trips around um, uh, the country published another version of the autobiography and uh, made quite a lot of money. But he wrote, he took the dictation and he wrote uh, most of, or he wrote the, the basis of both the uh, 1858 book and the 1877 autobiographies have the core of the 1849 autobiography. That's mm -hmm. all verbatim in there from from the original. Uh, so it's just adding uh, a lot of frivolity, <laughs> uh, a lot of the N word actually, mm. and, which was never in the original. Mm. And things said, uh, describing um, things that sometimes happened and sometimes we're not really sure happened. Uh, we can't, uh, I, I haven't been able to find evidence for some of the things that are described in the later autobiographies. So, and, um, so you have uh, then 
him being publicized in England as the real Uncle Tom and selling these books when John Loeb was selling the book. And then, Susan, the decision to to, to actually write this book, I mean, such a fascinating character, but out of all the other fascinating characters that you could have spent 10 years uh, researching a book on, uh, you chose somebody who who basically, whose very name, uh, or at least, uh, uh, you know, the name Un Uncle Tom that he's very closely as associated with uh, is, is one of the most sort of uh, rife combination of two words in the English language. And I'm just wondering, <laughs> what was the process for deciding this is the guy <laughs> I'm going to write this book about? Yeah. Well, uh, three reasons, really. You've already known one, that I'm a stickler for the facts, and I like to tell the true history. I like people to know um, that the real Uncle Tom was different from the Uncle, Uncle Tom that's being portrayed by the media. Even back in the, um, it started back during the Civil War because it, the book was banned in the South, so instead of the book, they put these shows on that depicted uh, Uncle Tom as uh, being uh, subservient and serving the whites and doing the whites' jobs. And, in order uh, to sort of this. counter it's, the mythology that the book Yes, was to counter in the, the, the book. And wow. so that kind of mythology was just continued on into the 20th century. And um, I wanted to put a stop to that, and so did a friend of mine by the name of Tony Cohen, who is African American, and he has gotten fame by walking to Canada twice, and he was on Oprah. Walking um, tracing, from Maryland, walking to Canada. From Maryland to Canada. Yeah, he uh, was tracing the footsteps of the uh, people who escaped uh, were escaping at the Underground and, Railroad. Yeah, he became quite famous for that, and so uh, he he's a friend of mine, and he said. Is we both believed that this myth of Uncle Tom needed to be corrected. Mm. And then I was um, actually employed by our county parks system as a public historian. And the county parks wanted to buy what was called Uncle Tom's Cabin in Bethesda, Maryland. Mm. This was the place where Josiah Hansen was enslaved. And there was a cabin that was attached to a house. The house uh, actually was older than the cabin. Um, so I got this um, registered on what's called the National Network to Freedom, which is uh, um, the official way to get a place recognized as an Underground Railroad site or program. And then the county bought the property. So I was involved in buying that property. And so I got very fascinated with Josiah Hansen at that time. And uh, Tony said to me, well, you and I should get together and write a book about him, write his, his real biography as opposed to his autobiographies. So uh, actually, Tony and I started to research together, but he's gone off to other things, uh, very good things. <laughs> And, um, and so I've plugged along, I've uh, been plugging along for about 11 years uh, on this book since I retired from being a historian for the Montgomery County Parks. Is Tony going to read your manuscript before you publish it? Or? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I've been consulting with him. Uh -huh. Yes. Uh, yeah. Can you give a sort of timeline of how the concept of Uncle Tom has evolved since uh, the, the actual, um, since, since the book was published in, in the popular culture? Well, the minstrel shows were very popular in, of course, the South, you know, because they depicted the uh, Blacks as being so stupid and, and manipulable and, and um, really a, a, sort of uh, reinforcing what they had grown up, the myth that they believed already about that. And then these minstrel shows were became popular in the North as well, and just because of their entertainment value. Now, they were changed a little bit when they came to the North, but they uh, actually had... Uh, 
play that was written that depicted Uncle Tom as being a a martyr like figure and uh, a Christ like figure, not not um, uh, not the subservient, um, uh, obedient, and doing the white's work. Not that character. So people, the, I think it was the, the media that really hung on to that idea. And it was part of Jim Crow. It was part of that, um, in which was very strong in the North. So in the early 20th century, then it was reinforcing the Jim Crow idea that uh, the Blacks are uh, not as, um, are not equal to the whites as mm -hmm. the reason for um, Jim Crow, you know. Yeah. And then later, uh, the term Uncle Tom, when did it become adopted as a insult? Uh, uh, it, like, well, like I think a, it just came out of that, that uh, those minstrel shows that were put on, the, the whole hype that was put on, that you, the idea that, that you were an Uncle Tom. And I think it's also the fact that people haven't read the book. Um, How many <laughs> if different you just books read are the there? Book, people have such <laughs> strong opinions on so many books that they've never read. I, 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 uh, yeah, I've got right. that more than usual <laughs> lately. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, and so just read the book. And read then read the my darn book. book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't just create opinions on books you've never read. And yeah. um, what's it been like uh, working on this book during the pandemic? It's kind of a perfect opportunity, to, uh, a perfect time to be working yes. on a book. Right? Yeah, yeah, you're stuck at home with your computer. <laughs> Which is yeah. what you're doing anyway when you're researching well, and writing. No, I, time, I actually did a lot of traveling. Um, my husband is from Wisconsin, so uh, every trip that we took between Maryland and Wisconsin, we would visit these places where Josiah Hansen had been. So we've been to Kentucky, to um, and, uh, every place I go. Of course, I visit the library and uh, the historical society and, and gather all firsthand in research information. So that um, was really a lot of fun, uh, traveling in the footsteps and traveling his escape route from Cincinnati up to um, Sandusky, Ohio, that, and then going to Canada and meeting um, some people there in Canada. They have uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin historic site there, uh, where the institute was. This the British American uh, Institute. So it, that was um, adventures, <laughs> and that uh, so that event. I couldn't do. Yeah. So I've had to do all of my research online, and a lot of things are being copied, you know, scanned and put online. But it's very frustrating when you find something and you it hasn't been scanned yet. Right? There <laughs> yeah. is a, people don't realize then, how much stuff has yeah. not been scanned yet. Yeah, despite all you the have stuff to has been scanned. find a library and write to the library and find out where can I get this. And, um, but one of the great finds was at the Boston Public Library, they had scanned the original manuscript where uh, the um, person who took the dictation from Josiah Henson actually, uh, his handwriting, in his handwriting, in uh, scratching out some things, and adding others. Um, it was wonderful to read that manuscript. And then if you're going to do a book tour, I imagine that uh, the, the route of the book tour is fairly well predetermined by the route of the underground, by, by Josiah uh, well, Henson's route. Yeah, right? I, mean, I think so. <laughs> I'd go to all those towns. <laughs> that would be yes, well, here in Montgomery County, Maryland, they have, uh, out of that original purchase of what was called Uncle Tom's Cabin, they've made that into a whole visit. They've got a visitor center. And they've got the whole place restored and interpreted. They have a visitor center with a museum and everything there. So that's any my plans first stop. as far as uh, a publication and and uh, any any yes, it, plans uh, for a book tour. It's uh, I don't have the plans for the book tour. Um, uh, Georgetown University has agreed to publish the book. Great. And I've sent it out for peer review, but I um, 
waiting to hear back before I get to sign a contract. <laughs> After How does I sign that a work? contract, it, we'll find when you're writing a book on on history, they they, they say, is that the standard procedure that that uh, they they go for peer review? Yes, mm -hmm. that is and then standard. Who are the peers that review it? How many I don't know. Okay. They would be probably. <laughs> I, I mean, what, what generally? Yeah. How does how many people it, does that generally involve when it's a history oh, period? Oh, two or three, probably. Mm -hmm. Just yeah. And um, so yeah, right now, hear hear about peer review when it comes to like new, new pharmaceutical products and that sort of thing, or or medical <laughs> journal. But I I didn't mm -hmm. even realize there was a peer review process for history books. But that's yes, that's yes. If it's a good, uh, if it's an actual history book that a not historical propaganda. novel, which I call an oxymoron. <laughs> Why do you call it an oxymoron? A historical novel. You can't be both historical and a novel. Right. You're yeah. either sticking to the facts or you're, you're making either stuff fiction up. or nonfiction. <laughs> a friend of mine, yeah. uh, he, he was a sort of, a, I guess, might describe as an amateur historian, but he, he always said uh, that if you want to understand a time period, uh, one of the best things to do is to read the popular fiction of the day. Do, do you think that's true, or is that uh, is that just a, a weird opinion? No, that that gives you a good opinion of the literature. I'd say if you want to get to know a period, read the newspapers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The newspapers are very revealing. Yeah, mm -hmm. not just the, the the yeah they have stole stories in there, and they actually reported the news. They and, and they had they separated the editorials from the news. It is. What what a concept. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, the advertising even are very interesting. And you can see like, reports of accidents. How many, when the trains came out, how many people were killed by trains and um, things like that. That's so that that's basically the first uh, first draft of history, the uh, sort of first, you know, source kind of research that the, the yeah. newspapers of the day. Mm. Yeah. Right, so, and then the you can archive, find out a lot. They, yeah, and and get, getting lost in archives is is uh, yeah good fun as well. <laughs> yeah, I love the archives. Yes, that's one of the things I miss about being quarantined is going into these old historical societies and finding things that they didn't know they had. <laughs> yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah. yeah, great, like gold mining. Yeah. Thanks so much for spending the hour with us here. It's been fun. Oh, it's been me. a pleasure, David. It really yeah. has. It's, yeah, really. Um, I love to, to talk about history. Yeah, me too. <laughs> it's two of us. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, excellent. Mm -hmm. Well, take care. I will see you uh, See you around soon, I hope. Post oh, okay. Uh, in June, we're, going, we're coming out there in June. Oh, excellent. See you in Portland yep. in June. Excellent. Yep. Good. Great. That's just next month, even. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Take care, Susan. Okay. Thanks. See ya. And thanks to everybody out there for joining in on this discussion with Susan Soderberg, author of the upcoming book about the real Josiah Henson, which you can uh, look out for. And, um, on Friday, I will be talking to Bev Grant, who is a fantastic musician from New York City, who uh, took a lot of amazing photographs in the late 1960s when she was especially seriously into photography. And she's coming out with a book of photos from 1969. And uh, we're going to share some of those photos and talk about the book on Friday. And um, if you're in Portland, then we're going to have a jam session, I think, on Sunday afternoon. Uh, look up on social media for information about that. And uh, if you're looking for the archived version of this discussion with Susan, then look for it on uh, youtube.com slash drovix or look for This Week with David Rovix wherever you get your podcasts. And thanks very much. Remember, mutual aid will get us through. Don't pay the rent unless you really have to. Don't believe unsubstantiated quotes that you see on the internet. And I hope to see you around. Bye for now.